Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the BEAT Forum. Uh, just to let you know, we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We'll just wait for everyone to uh, join us. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to point out that this event is being recorded and will be posted to the BEAT YouTube page for those who can't attend. So all the participants' microphones were muted upon entry, but you'll be able to submit your questions during the panel discussion in the Q&A section at the bottom um, center of your screen. So we'll read your questions following the moderated discussion. Uh, so the chat box, which is right, uh, just right to your Q&A, uh, can be used for any immediate troubleshooting assistance. So if you have any IT issues, uh, please just message in that box. Uh, should we encounter any interruptions or any major technical issues during the webinar, uh, we will terminate the webinar, but all attendees will receive a new link by email. So welcome to our fourth uh, annual BEAT Forum event, responding to the question, how can we design more equitable spaces? My name is Maya Mahbub Desai, and I'm an executive member of BEAT. Joining me today are my fellow forum co-organizers and executive members, Stephanie Hussein and Sephora Zahedi. So we would like to begin by acknowledging the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat who are the original owners and custodians of the land from which we are connecting to you virtually. As this event is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, we recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory you are currently on and ask that you acknowledge the territory you are connecting from and the current treaty holders. I would like to now invite the chair of the BEAT executive, Stephanie Hussein, to speak about the organization. Welcome everybody. Uh, Building Equality and Architecture Toronto, BEAT for short, is a volunteer run organization founded in 2015 that promotes equality in the profession through advocacy, mentorship and networking. BEAT aims to advance the achievements and visibility of underrepresented groups and work towards a greater diversity and equity on a systemic level. Events are open to everyone and target all phases of an architect's career. BEAT believes that design excellence goes hand in hand with diversity and equity. In order for architects to do great work, we must contribute to our fullest using the tools and resources available to each of us. A diverse, equitable profession will have a more powerful voice and a greater ability to create built environments that are beautiful, functional, and enhance the human experience for all. 
BEAT is one of several BEA chapters located across the country, working towards inclusivity and equity in architecture. Back to you, Maya. Thank you, Stephanie. Today's forum will include short presentations by our invited panelists and a panel discussion, followed by a Q&A session where attendees will be able to ask questions. So we invite you to type your questions in the Q&A comment box located at the bottom of your Zoom window at any time during the event. So please note, we'll try our best to answer all questions, uh, time permitting. So today we're honored to be joined by our panelists, Sarah Ibrahim, Tarisha Dolinik, Lorraine Cazier, and Lori Brown. We will begin our first presentation uh, with Zara Ibrahim. Zara Ibrahim is the CEO of Monumental, an organization dedicated to supporting an equitable recovery from COVID-19 by building fair and just cities and institutions. She has led organizations across sectors that design and deliver participatory and equity-centered approaches to policy, service, and infrastructure development. She is an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto's Geography and Planning Department, the chair of the board of the Park People, and the vice chair of the Canadian Urban Institute. So join me in welcoming Zara. Thanks so much, Maya, and good morning, folks. Um, I am joining you this morning from Treaty 13 territory in Ticoronto, and I'm really, really excited to be in this conversation and just in the space where we're interrogating the status quo and the conventions that drive um, you know, architecture and equitable space and the creation of equitable space. And it did make me think, you know, as I was reflecting on, you know, some of what I wanted to share with this particular group, it made me think a lot about when I was newer in my, you know, younger in my practice and newer to the profession. And I had just finished up my degree in uh, cities and architecture. And I would go to forums like this all the time. I don't know how many folks uh, here, you can tell us in the chat, are students. But, you know, I would spend so much time at events like this. And I'd be so excited. And then, you know, hearing all these questions, you know, how do we imagine change? And how do we build more equitable cities? And how do we think about the architecture profession? And, you know, I hope, you know, I, I would leave those events hopefully as you'll leave today, um, feeling like really inspired and energized and ready to step into this like future we had created and, you know, the hour and a half event that we had had together. And, you know, as I went out into the world after events like this, I think, you know, I started wanting to understand how we bring the ideas that we talk about in these spaces to life. And I found sort of a few things were really clear to me. The first was the things I was hearing in these spaces, and this was about 15 years ago, the things I was hearing in these spaces around fairness and equity and justice and, um, you know, the way in which we build in more inclusive ways, they seemed to be just intellectual exercises that began and end, ended at the end of, you know, sessions like this. And the second piece was that, you know, whatever you know, was going to change, whatever part of the conversation was a call to action and wasn't just an intellectual exercise. It didn't include the we, how do we imagine equitable spaces? How do we imagine change? The we didn't include people like me. You know, at the time I was, you know, younger, <laughs> a young racialized woman in the architecture practice and lacking traditional credentials. I'm not a licensed or registered architect, but um, someone who believes so deeply in the practice and have studied it. Um, and so the we didn't include people like me. And so that's where I wanted to start us off today. And I feel very lucky to get to go first and sort of ground our conversation in, you know, who in fundamentally sort of interrogating, and I want to sort of share my screen here, you know, oh, there we go. Let me just see here. This is the we, right? I don't know if this is these, these folks are familiar to all of you. <laughs> But when I started out, this was the we of architecture. It was non-racialized men. It was largely men largely over the age of 50. Um, and the we that I was hearing in these sessions where there was all these great visions about the future of city and the future of public space was 
for people like them, people with their credentials to come together and rethink and get galvanized around the future of communities and spaces. So I, I, I ground us in this today because I don't think that any of this comes from ill intent or from intentional exclusion, but I do think that as uh, designers and architects and people in the city building space, I think there is an urgent imperative to reorient our practice and to rethink the mindset that we step into these spaces with, a mindset that is intentional about who we are in our identities and how those part, different parts of our identities might shape blind spots, might give us power, but in many cases might distance us from power. And one of the things that has occurred to me in my practice around doing community design and my work has really been around how do we bring folks who have experienced marginalization into the process of building our cities and communities is that we don't start by having the conversation about why we come to this. Why are we building? And one of my favorite theorists and designers and practitioners is Antoinette Carroll, who runs a creative reaction lab at Chicago. And she talks a lot about when we are designing spaces, before we get in, even if it's the most inclusive and participatory process, if we don't identify the individuals, the individual humans, not the organizations, but the individual people that we are stepping into this space and how we arrived here and how this space is getting redesigned, how and why. If we don't talk about the power associated with each of our different roles, the role of an architect is a powerful role. Even if you think that you're junior or you're just starting out in your career or, um, you know, you are often perceived as someone with a lot of power. So talking about the power constructs that come with us when we step into these spaces and how we need to sort of address those and recognize how you know, we need to maybe shift our behavior so that the, our, our power doesn't over, you know, um, take over the space and that we're making space for others. And so, you know, I, I think in her framework, what she's trying to encourage us to do is have a conversation about our individual and collective agendas before we go into designing spaces. And so, you know, the why of all of this, like why we need to do this interrogation, why we need to think about who is designing spaces is that our cities are not working, right? Our built environments are not working. We've seen this through the pandemic over the last number of, a number of years now is that the spaces that we are building they might be beautiful, but they are not working for everyone. They are working for some. You know, I heard um, in, in a panel recently, I, I was, uh, there's a woman, Carolyn Crawley, who runs Missa Kanoma, which is an incredible indigenous organization dealing with public space. And they talked about how so many of the spaces that are meant to be equitable, like public space, are actually spaces of oppression. There are spaces where people feel like they are being surveilled. There are places that don't have design interventions that signal belonging. There are places that are actually not bringing us together, but actually pushing us back into our corners and making us feel more distant. And so, my call to us today is how do we start to think about the plurality of voices that are included in a design process? Because I think specific to architecture, there's a real fear around the, what happens if we are, as the technical experts, are not on top what happens to our professionalism, to our credentials, what does that mean for our role? And, you know, I think our role is, should be to use our technical expression to bring to life the wants and the wishes and the needs of those that we are actually designing for. And in my experience, we're not super good at that. You know, that involves, that's not surveying people, that's not doing public consultation, that's actually talking about people's whole life, talking about what, is, what do you want for yourself? What does, you know, a day look like for you? What are spaces that make you feel good? Where do you go when you're not at work or at home? And talking to people about the full sort of expression of their lives versus just the moments that we're interested in, which often when we say, you know, what do you want for your community? What do you want in terms of, you know, things in your city, people say, you know, I want parks, I want, you know, safe communities, I want walkable communities, affordable housing, but lacking the specificity that we need to actually bring those spaces to life. So to, in order to be able to include a more, you know, pluralistic point of view in our design projects, we need to think about ways in which we can just have stronger relationships with people who have the lived experiences that we're designing for, but also 
to rethink how we're asking questions. And so an example I was thinking about was uh, a few years ago when I was working on the Sidewalk Labs project and we were doing research around belonging in public space. And we were trying to think about how people who didn't live close to the waterfront and the Sidewalk Labs project was on Toronto's waterfront, how people who live away from the waterfront actually feel a sense of belonging. And so instead of doing public consultations and you know, um, specifically asking about people's experiences about public space, we set up you know, WhatsApp groups with residents all over the city and said, just like when you're not at work and not at home, tell us what places you love. And one day we got a text message and it was a picture of a chair in a mall. And well, look what looked like a mall. And this young 18 year old, this 18 year old young man said to us, this is my favorite space in the city. And we said, we texted back. We said, why is that? He said, well, you know, it's, um, you know, it was just a chair outside of a Cinnabon. And he said, it's warm. I can sit here for as long as I like. I don't have to share it with anyone. I can people watch and, and, but no one really disturbs me. And so it's my perfect public space. And we use that as, as inputs for our thinking around, okay, this is, this is the grand public space that this young man really feels a sense of belonging and safety and home within. And you don't get that kind of information when you sit down and survey people. And so as we think about sort of increasing the voices that are included, if we don't necessarily have the power to actually, you know, do deep co-design processes on every project we do, there are opportunities like just having normal human conversations with people, meeting them where they are, allowing us to give them or them to give us information when they are ready to do it is a really beautiful way of getting, you know, insights and stories that you may never get um, in more formal settings. I really do, you know, uh, I've seen this through my career on different infrastructure projects that people have um, don't use the language that we use. And so part of the, the question and the conversation I want to have today is when we prompt folks who we want to include in our process with things like equitable space even, uh, or public space, or inclusive space, it doesn't necessarily mean a lot. So I really do think, you know, part of our practice and part of identifying our power and some of the ways in which our power as designers and architects and creators of space starts to create barriers is starting to get very clear about how we speak about it outside of engaging people. We also just need to speak in plain language. So I know I'm just looking at my time. I think I'm coming up on time. But one of the things I wanted to just sort of leave with us as we go into the conversation is you know, even if in every situation it can't be a participatory co-design process, I think that it is possible to spend some time at the start of every design process, even with our design teams, talking about who we are and the power that we hold and the parts of our identity, like where we were educated, like our geography, like our race, like our gender, starting to have conversations about who we are and how we step into the space. I think as part of that, there should be a relentless commitment to understanding the limits of our knowledge. Part of our understanding our identities is understanding where our lived experience ends and someone else begins and where we need to invite people in to fill in those blanks. And a reminder that putting you know, architects at a table with a broader community of voices is, doesn't undermine or threaten our role as designers and creators of these spaces. It actually is an act of responsibility because it is reckless to try and create equitable spaces when the edges of our lived experience don't actually represent those who we are trying to serve. And, you know, I, I feel confident, you know, especially with forums like Beat and some of the spaces that are emerging that we're past that place, you know, that, that I started I talked about at the start of this talk, which was, you know, where these were in conversations like this were uh, intellectual exercises. I really do believe that where we have arrived now is a commitment to action, but it is going to take flipping some of the conventions around how we behave as we go into design processes, how we identify self um, as we go into them. It's going to take some, some flipping of our conventions and flipping of orthodoxies to really start to consistently create equitable spaces, not just equitable spaces as special projects, but have all the places we contribute to be representative of, representative of the voices that we're serving. So I'll leave it there. I know I'm getting close to my time.
Thank you, Zara, uh, for sharing that very interesting perspective on questioning our design processes. Um, our next presenter is Tarisha Dolinik. Hi, Tarisha. Tarisha is a partner of MJMA, an award-winning architectural practice and research-based studio in Toronto, and leads the interior architecture practice within the firm. She has over 25 years of experience focusing her career on equitable placemaking within community, recreation, academic, and library design, maintaining focus on design excellence and the achievement of many design awards. Tarisha is both a registered architect and interior designer and believes in holistic design approach to interior architecture, connecting urban landscape, architecture, interiors, environmental graphics, and accessible design to create world-renowned built environments that transcribe ideas of community, health, and wellness into bespoke architectural solutions. Tarisha focuses on a strength-based approach to the design process, looking at the opportunity to enhance community relationships. She recognizes the importance of co-creating and that communities are experts in their own communities. Welcome, Tarisha. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and look forward to participating in this session. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about what uh, does it mean for public space to be well designed? Is it about um, how it looks, how it works, how it feels? or for whom it's made for. And it's kind of what Zara was talking about with this kind of refinement of what this is and better recognizing um, individuals of that concept of we. Um, in inclusive placemaking, there needs to be an understanding of the environment and the individual's ability to adapt to it. Um, and defining the whom it is for that we must consider the full range of uh, human diversity and know that it's unimaginably um, complex. So yes, it's physical, but we also know that we have to think about the sensory, um, cognitive, sexual identity, cultural, um, things like social economic, and it just goes on and on and on. So this will be forever uh, evolving um, and the texture of these differences continues to um, get more and more refined. Um, what we do know is that this presence of difference uh, defines diversity and, in and that design has the potential to shape complex urban futures by crafting the physical setting for life in public places. So what is its power to achieve social cohesive public design? Um, I'd like to start by introducing you to a book I'm currently reading. It's called Mismatch by Cat Holmes, um, which talks about how objects and technology which are intentionally designed to meet a purpose sometimes unintentionally exclude others from using it. Um, over centuries, we've excluded others by design, dictating who and how a space should or shouldn't be used that um, actually promotes solar uh, polarization, which is kind of the antithesis of what we want to do here. And so we as designers have to think of this through an interdisciplinary lens and look at urban design and landscape um, and architecturally as well, both interior and exterior. So this is Sarah Ross's work, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, which addresses architecture structures in public environment that made users fit into or onto structures that were um, actually designed to deny them. Uh, but we also have to think about things like environmental graphic design and signage um, and how to incorporate marketing within a space and its impact on the users and the understanding that representation of things like race and gender can have a huge impact on that sense of belonging by others. Um, we need to consider things like materiality and color. Uh, this was a conference session I did on color, which responded to my angst about um, using institutional branding colors developed for stationery and pens and being forced to use them um, uh, in the architecture by our clients. Um, so it made me think of how a catchment area of a project site can define the main users of place and the diversity of cultures within that community. Um, but it can make one rethink that color choice in architecture has to be carefully thought about um, as color meaning across cultures can vary quite differently and affect the way someone interacts with or feels comfortable or safe in a space. So inclusive places can happen anywhere for any building type in any program, like the National Museum of African American History, where the building is kind of this closed chalice to guard the kind of um, uh, collections that it's, it's housing, um, but the architects recognized that this wasn't enough and conceived a separate can uh, canopy plaza that promoted social gatherings, celebrations, and community engagement. 
or looking at the Shelby Farms Park and the thought that outside inside space that creates a comfortable environment in extreme weather. And it's just super simple approach to this. So at MJM Architecture and Design, we have committed 30 years of uh, trying to strengthen the social connection and inclusive placemaking through architecture. So instead of showing case studies, I thought I would focus on some design principles that we could really think about um, and how successful design must be exclusive to be inclusive, um, but it also has to be inclusive to be exclusive. And let me tell you what I mean um, by this conundrum. Um, people need to feel safe. They do so, um, uh, they are more likely to engage and stay uh, in a place. These places also have to have a history within the community of being safe. Um, when people engage in public space, they generally want to attract support and express themselves. They also want to hear from those who are different regarding their social perspective. Uh, but these expectations can actually be distracted by limitations of over access by some groups or that sense of uh, too much control or surveillance as Zara also noted. Um, user group variety must be moderated, but this can be super, super challenging, um, especially when you think about um, equitable placemaking. So this misbalance of user group variety often um, can occur actually when social culture and history of public space gets erased or it isn't present um, within it. So expressing identities and values of community within design creates meaning and can um, in turn kind of inform this idea of place attachment, which in turn creates community pride. Um, where local people feel protective and regard their place as theirs, but also want to share it and welcome people to discover what their community is all about, and also makes people from outside the community curious and want to incur, um, engage to learn and discover as well. So what are some of the mechanisms to express community identity and values? Inclusive placemaking should connect um, to and express the history and heritage of place. It should communicate culture through authentic co-design relationships that speak about strength-based approach to design. Um, it needs to think of ways to express identity of place and context. Um, this is our University of Auckland Student Centre, where um, a central circulation core was conceived as a vertical connector of programs. Um, it had a really uh, deep floor plate with minimal access to natural light and views. So we used a color theory approach to a baton design that connects the unique colors of New Zealand, how the colors of the land connect to the colors of the sky that enhance that over spatial and social experience and helped with um, wayfinding as you moved up um, and down through, through the building. Um, ideas of promoting territories and individuals, um, this might seem like kind of an exclusive approach, um, and it can kind of uh, dovetail into that concept of territorialism and um, the, the thing that connects um, kind of more residential planning community concepts with the thought that when people who feel um, they have possession of something, they want to care for it. Um, but in this case, it's kind of, I'm thinking about it more creating territories for groups that become specific to needs and expressions for specific people within a larger whole of the space. Um, sometimes by doing this, it allows for adjacent activities to happen simultaneously, promoting awareness um, of each other and values, um, sharing of resources and social interaction and support uh, amongst different groups and different people. Um, and something we're also looking at uh, doing more um, for our projects, can we look at how to include local industries or how to get community participation in the actual making of the space or things within it. Um, this in turn enhances community connection and awareness of what another do in their community and just distribute positive economic opportunities um, within the community itself. Um, so inclusive to be exclusive, uh, that's the other kind of flip side of this. Um, it's a little bit more straightforward. Um, inclusive design of space must be driven by the community, um, ideally from the pursuit phase, pre-design, um, the engagement, end of design, um, and execution, and way after commissioning. So go talk to the community way after the building is in use and see what the people think and hold yourself accountable to, to, to it. Um, you have to uh, fit out spaces both inside and outside that provide the ultimate amenities for cultural activities. Think of public lobby as event space or community guild or as an art gallery, um, parking lots as playgrounds or vendor platforms. 
Um, this maximizes opportunities for underrepresented people to attract attention of what they do and who they are and build up their customers based uh, community attention and support. Um, gaining social consciousness through program proxemics and the transparencies uh, through two programs brings awareness to community program offerings. Um, when people see what is going on, they are more likely to participate uh, and become part of the social uh, fabric. Um, spaces and programs need to be restorative and respond to the needs of users and blur their experiential boundaries between them to maximize social cohesion and this value of belonging for everybody. Um, and then thinking about just simple things like choice and what types of spaces to engage in allows for options for different levels of social interaction and privacy, um, giving users a sense of confidence and self-control. Um, and this is actually something very specific um, when we speak of uh, trauma-informed uh, design placemaking as well. An outside and inside connection to not only uh, get people visually or physically connected to natural or to nature and biophilia, um, but also how you can enhance sustainable design awareness by um, designing buildings as sustainable learning tools. Uh, think about displaying something simple like the generation of power and water, um, embedding this as culture and everyday activities and routines, uh, integral to social experiences, and again, um, enriching community story about identity and values. So here are my um, takeaways about equitable placemaking. Um, Thank you for listening to my really brief 10 minute uh, summary of something uh, that I do like to go on and on about, um, but uh, equitable placemaking uh, must be understanding of the environment and individual's ability to adapt to it. Um, it must take into consideration that human difference and diversity is constantly involving and unimaginably complex. Um, solutions to it have to be interdisciplinary approach to design, and it must be neither entirely inclusive uh, nor exclusive uh, to be successful. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Teresha. Our next presenter is Laureen Tazier. Laureen is a senior associate at BDB Quadrangle and also coordinates and manages the accessibility and wellness practice of human space, BDP's global inclusion and well-being consultancy, including team operations, project delivery, and client relationships. She works towards pushing for a higher level of accessibility and wellness in all of her projects and steers the practice towards projects that will have a meaningful impact. She strategically analyzes the market and client needs while also contributing her technical expertise on accessibility, wellness requirements, and inclusive design strategies to a range of projects. Being well accredited, Maureen is also able to advise clients on how to optimize their built environments for human wealth, health and well being. Maureen's passion for inclusion derives from her background in public health and nursing. It is her goal to impress upon designers and builders the responsibility of creating environments that can be enjoyed by all and to help apply the lens of inclusion to all decisions made about a project. She has led complex building accessibility audits, consulted on large scale P3 and PDC projects for all building types and has created numerous accessibility based design guidelines. Her experience includes working with interdisciplinary teams that include architecture firms, municipalities, and government bodies such as Infrastructure Ontario. Welcome, Maureen. Thanks, Maya. It's always a, a little cringing to hear someone read my <laughs> bio. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So good morning, everyone. I see some familiar names and faces in the audience. So, um, you know, happy to see your name there. And hopefully this isn't the first or last time we connect in the near future. Um, Maya, can, it, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great, great. Okay, so I'm just gonna run through a few slides here. Um, so the past 18 months have been like no other. The imaginal, unimaginable grips of COVID-19, mass social isolation, the fear of unknown have really affected us all. In some ways, I'd say, especially for us in architectural design professionals, the pandemic really has forced us to forced us to rethink 
how our cities and buildings and communities are designed. And how the built environment can better suit the needs of diverse populations. So I'm just going to take a break to pause here and make sure this presentation is accessible to viewers who may not be able to see my images. I've just scrolled through a series of images of various, um, oops, excuse me, various urban, um, urban cities across the world that are eerily empty and in a pre-pandemic world probably would have been packed with people. So that last image showing a contrast between large planned urban towers and city centers contrasted against contrasted against organic developments of housing. On the screen here, I don't know if many of you caught this, but it really caught my eye at the turn of the pandemic, is a headline of an article published by Matthew Keegan in the BBC about how the coronavirus, coronavirus could make the world more accessible. Um, you know, I encourage you to look it up, but all of a sudden power door operators and wider spaces became sort of a thing of, hey, let's implement this to to you know, manage you know, the spread of COVID-19. But all along as accessibility specialists, you know, these are some basic strategies that we had been talking about for so, for so long. So in many ways I've seen and understand this pandemic to really increase our appetite well, collectively um, to do better. So how will we adapt? Um, as the design, professional in as design professionals within the industry within our communities um, as a collective society um, there are certainly different ways in which uh, we can understand how inclusive environments come together so i'm hoping to spark your thought around some critical design choices we make that impact our ability to create environments um, i just want to give a little heads up i've included some historical images that may be upsetting for some so just a little bit of viewer discretion advised is advised, but in short, I'm going to start off with saying, you know, we do have the power and the responsibility to create inclusive environments. So uh, Zara and Trisha, Trisha have, you know, talked a little bit about what that means. But what does it mean to us to create inclusive environments? The CCDI or this Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion, um, talk about inclusion as capturing the uniqueness of individuals and creating an environment that values and respects individuals for their talents, skills, and, ab and abilities to benefit the collective. Or perhaps in more plain language, um, thinking about inclusion as the act of being included um, and being um, part of, of the decision-making process. Throughout history, we've been making design choices that have intentionally excluded people from fulfilling from fulfilling in, in engaging spaces that we work, live, and play. Some of the design choices have been explicit signs of a hostility, while others have been inadvertently hostile. But the end outcomes have been the same for those who've experienced the negative implications and choices, that of one not being welcome, excluded, or and not belonging. So in this image here, um, you know, maybe familiar to some, but the decision to provide two separate water fountains where one looks more robust on the left and the other one looks less robust on the right was a mean to segregate those who could and could not use the water fountain based on race. Or some, some would like to say racism in design. Choices we make about the types of washrooms we provide in our built spaces demonstrate our values and who have we been designed for. Historically, washrooms have been assigned by gender, leaving trans and gender diverse people without a space for safe washroom use. Regardless of gender identity or expression, trans and gender diverse people can use, can use the all gender toilet, wash their hands and check the mirror, decreasing the potential anxiety of fear um, and gender, diver gender diverse people while using the facil facilities. So without the lack of these spaces, we create the unnecessary risk for people. Too often I hear organizations that are against the provision of all gendered washrooms from reasons that range from varying levels of fear to one's, from one's safety um, or simply unaware of the impacts of not providing the space. Um, you know, this is, this is what I like to sort of call and think about is transphobia in design. Lastly, just a last example about historical monuments, you know, featuring exuberant elements um, and signaling a welcoming to a grand space. 
However, without the presence of a graded entry or an accessible ramp, these buildings are not welcoming to all persons. So when I'm thinking about ableism in design, that would be a piece. So in short, you know, I believe that thinking about different ways and in discovering innovations to our problem solving to design can help us potentially grow and improve upon our previous creations, designs, and ideas. So on the image here, um, you know, is a co series of co-design sessions I held at uh, OCAD University focusing on accessibility in the built environment. So at Human Space, um, our collective goal is to elevate the human experience through built environments that embody inclusivity, promote equity and well-being. A very sort of high level statement, but it is really something that we are privileged to be able to do through our work. We've collaborated with others to deliver more than 300 projects over the past decade, spanning from healthcare, residential, workplace, hospitality, recreation, education, transportation, the public realm, and so all these little tiny boxes you see on the screen are a series of images of projects that we've worked on throughout the years. As design professionals, we make choices and decisions about how the built environment comes together. I've shared a few examples of some historical precedents in the past and some that continue to happen today. I absolutely recognize that I'm extremely privileged to come into a project with a singular focus come in wanting to talk about inclusion and accessibility. And for those of you who, who may not practice as a specialized consultant, I get it. There are many competing factors that you are trying to balance. But as an accessibility specialist, um, I've learned that some of the better projects that have come around have been those that have involved design partners who have leaned in the discussion of how to do better. So questioning the choices we make, challenging what I, what, you know, what I bring to the table and having that engaged discussion. But with the rapid changes and shifts we've seen in the past 18 months, shifts in understanding about what's expected, what's no longer acceptable, what expectations do we play around social justice, how we create an environments where design, how we create an environment uh, where we design can either respond or simply do nothing. So on the image here um, is a woman protesting the death of George Floyd in Montreal last spring. Um, I get it, it's intimidating. It can force us to recoil into sticking into, you know, let's just do what we know, which is let's stick to our checklists and building codes. And really we've recognized that there's so much more that we can be doing. So over the past months within our studio, Human space and collaboration with our firm YB, the key belonging team, have led a series of think tanks. Groups of us really started to unravel and question how can we be doing better? It was very clear that there were a series of organizational and cultural explorations that were required. But as a design and urbanism and architecture practice, what was our role in social justice? Do we play a role in systemic racism? What skill sets and knowledge do we need? Or do we need to possess as an organization to address these issues? Do we have to accept the status quo? What does the role of inclusive design play and how does it, how does it unravel? For too long, um, and in our codified approaches to inclusion, it's really been about accessibility and inclusion of persons with disabilities. However, as you've heard from my fellow colleagues who've just spoken, we really understand that inclusion is much more. Using the protected grounds under the Ontario Human Rights Code in Canada and the protected characteristics under the Equality Act in the UK, we've used these characteristics to brainstorm how underrepresented or equity deserving groups can be represented in the built environment to be more inclusive. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, there's still much work that needs to be done around creating equitable spaces and opportunities for persons with disabilities. But in the broader context of today and a broader awakening and desire to do better, we've definitely captured the attention of ourselves as a profession, our clients, to refocusing on recognizing the value of inclusive design strategies and practices. By facilitating these think tanks, um, our goal was to continue to broaden our collective understanding within the firm, 
and the organization to understand what it means to design an inclusive built environment. We used a digital uh, board to collaborate and collect ideas. And so here my colleague, Edward Dimmock in the Glasgow studio um, shared his experience of what it meant to, to the redevelopment of the Queen Street station. So there were a series of sticky notes that he shared on the, on the, the mirror board. And really a big part of his work was an engaging as, you know, they've identified, he's identified it here as an accessibility inclusion consultation. But really the concept of designing for neurodiversity became a big part of, of making this uh, train station more inclusive. We had discussions around social mobility where my colleague Melissa Dieppe, a junior planner in our Toronto studio, understood her, her um, role as a planner and what it meant to creating more equitable neighborhoods. So, you know, there were definitely rules around the design profession enhancing social mobility, but what else could we be doing from a planning perspective was part of her uh, discourse. While my colleague Daniel in London engaged in a discussion about race, color, and culture. Uh, what you see here on the screen was the mural board that was put together for that. And some really challenging questions were brought up. How do we, oops, how do we design for, who are we designing with? How does policy impact the character style of our buildings and highlighting on specific projects as the Poundberry design code? And thinking about, I'm just trying to move this, thinking about, you know, the impacts of colonization and, and what you know design could look like and um, you know really great discussions around what that meant and what that meant to us as designers and sort of reflecting on where we stood in sort of the context that we currently exist in. You know this was definitely an internal in-house strategy to openly dissect and have honest conversations about what it means to design for inclusion and what the impact of design does when an inclusive and diverse perspectives are, are, are part of the discussion. We looked at historical precedents and policies that have negatively affected marginalized or communities that have not been included to apply a new lens to our work to avoid repeating the same mistakes. I've seen an ongoing demand from others to understand you know, who's left out of the design discourse and what are the conversation points that need to be brought forward. We certainly did not come up with all the answers, but Collectively, we've begun to grow the understanding that definitely um, there's a broader discussion that needs to happen and a self-reflection and honesty about it within the firm. Through this lens of inclusive design processes and think tanks, we've you know, had this opportunity for safe spaces and understanding ultimately who should be included in design um, and really giving us the confidence or at least the courage to engage in those discussions, recognizing that times are changing, there's an understanding and expectation to be doing better. So where do we begin? How do we begin to ask ourselves those questions and how do we continue to do that research before engaging in projects? We've discovered and learned that within our everyday roles, uh, we can definitely design uh, better um, we are uniquely positioned um, with skill sets and understanding about the built environment, but layering on those intentionally broader and strategically perspectives is, is somewhere where we, where we can grow upon. So we each exude a sphere of influence. That's what I'd like to call it. I'm um, in our part of a system that can contribute to change. So I ask you, you know, as design professionals, Recognizing that we're constantly making choices about the built environment. You know, what is your sphere of influence? And what will you do within it? So that's really the end of, of what I'm hoping to share here with you. Um, I've put a bunch of words here on this, page, on this page. It's by no means a comprehensive list but definitely areas to begin sort of thinking about maybe what the difference are, is or the similarities between these strategies and framework pieces um, and what they mean to uh, creating an inclusive built environment. So I'll end there and, um, and uh, hand it over back to uh, Maya.
Thank you so much, Laurie. Our final presenter is Laurie Brown. Laurie's research focuses on relationships between architecture and social justice, with a particular emphasis on gender and its impact on spatial relationships. Her two books include Feminist Practices, Interdisciplinary Approaches to Women in Architecture, and Contested Spaces, Abortion Clinics, Women's Shelters, and Hospitals. Her two current book projects include Birthing Centers, Borders, and Bodies, and co-editing the Bloomsbury Global Encyclopedia of Women in Architecture, 1960 to 2015, with Dr. Karen Burns. She is a co-founder and leads Architects, a, a women and, and architecture group bridging the academy and practice in New York City. She is a professor of architecture and the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Syracuse University, and is a registered architect in the New York State. She received a Bachelor of Science from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a Master of Architecture from Princeton University. Welcome, Lori. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you all and to be a part of this panel. And before I begin, I would like to speak, to uh, provide my land acknowledgement. I too am in the traditional territory of the Six Nations of the Haudenosaunee people. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land and to recognize their continued stewardship in this region. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So when I think about the questions we were asked to consider, how can we design equitable public spaces? And given my location within the academy, I immediately consider knowledge production and research pursued. It is critical to understand who creates and writes knowledge, disciplinary knowledge, what a canon means, whose voices it represents, and most importantly, whose voices it suppresses, ignores, or prevents from being heard. So I'd like to begin with a quick quote from Donna Haraway, because I think it really speaks to what I'm going to be uh, presenting to you. She writes, it matters what thoughts think thoughts. It matters what knowledges know knowledges. It matters what relations relate relations. It matters what worlds world worlds. It matters what stories tell stories. As an educator, it is vitally important for my students to be aware of such constructions because as future architects and designers, they will not live nor will they practice in a vacuum. Knowledge and by extension voices yield power. So the spaces of equity I will discuss are both literal spaces where access significantly matters. So for example, reproductive healthcare and educational and action oriented spaces like the academy and the classroom where equity structures the frameworks of my endeavors. For this brief presentation, I will highlight four areas of my work to illustrate how I prioritize equity in different ways. The first is the politics of space. I am motivated for the discipline to engage with contemporary spatial politics. And so this, the research that I will show you, uh, which culminated at one point in the book, Contested Spaces, um, remains an incredibly polarizing issue in various parts of North America and beyond. Abortion, in this case, provides an interesting platform to think through complex relationships of space, the body, varying degrees of federal and state control, the potentials of design thinking to transform spatial relationships in ways to radically rethink and find agency within them. The research exposes and makes visual the complexities responsible for creating, creating these contested landscapes. So for me, I, I remain quite interested in how legislation and laws impact the actual geography on the ground and the ability to physically access care. So part of this research results in mapping. So in this case, at the time of publication, the gray areas are metropolitan um, zones in the United States where there was access to a provider. I'm interested in also analyzing and understanding how Supreme Court decisions impact the literal dimensions around bodies and buildings that provide uh, 
safety and security for those trying to provide and access care. So this work and some of the other things I have been doing have led to ways to take action and become an activist. There have been many tangents to the, the work around contested spaces, and it's included design work for several US clinics, uh, looking at building code analysis, as well as interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, exploring reproductive healthcare access, extending architecture's engagement beyond the discipline. And I want to highlight just a few. The first is through building code analysis. And this would be something when I was in school and as a young practitioner, I never imagined I would be interested in, but I became uh, aware that lawyers were having trouble understanding or being able to argue in front of the courts why building code changes um, should not happen. So myself and some research assistants went through and analyzed some of the most restrictive uh, building code changes that were happening across the United States. So this is an example of Texas. And we created very banal diagrams so that lawyers could use these in front of the courts, in front of the judge to, to make clear why these changes were not improving the health and safety of these spaces, but were really used as political mechanisms to close clinics. So when you think about in, increasing hallway widths, needing to add closets, uh, more restrooms, and even uh, intensive HVAC systems, these all become incredibly expensive uh, that pretty much most of these clinics who are operating on a shoestring budget are unable to afford. And so they closed over half the clinics in Texas, as an example. Another area that this has allowed uh, me to engage in is design. So I was introduced to the clinic owner and director for the clinic in Huntsville, Alabama. And they are interested in creating a more private and secure space, joining two properties, um, and really helping protect the patients and the employees from protesters. So the idea is to extend the, the parking and the entrance so it displaces protesters a bit farther from the entrance to the building to wrap this uh, area with a, a, a fence that would change depending on the, the kind of pressures it would be receiving. And the, the owner was really interested in using um, this wall as both a mechanism to uh, water grass, but also potentially to water protesters who may just be happening to stand on the other side of the wall. So the wall becomes multifaceted. It creates a sculptural space on the inside that would eventually uh, be filled with landscape and plants and then becomes a, a much stronger solid surface on the exterior. So the, the wall takes on different uh, formal and spatial and material uh, uh, recognition as it makes its way around the property. And here's an ex a view of what that sidewalk could potentially look like, as well as needing a shading device. It gets incredibly hot in the Alabama summers um, and an area for children who were there accompanying uh, their, their mothers um, and relatives to play um, while they wait uh, outside for when the procedure is happening. Another area that I want to quickly highlight is around women in architecture. Um, this work really was um, prompted by students. They, early in my career, they were incredibly frustrated and talked to me about not learning very much about women and people of color and all of their courses. And I realized now that I was in the academy, I could no longer be empathetic and recognize this was a similar experience I had, but I had to take action and change it. So it began, my first endeavors was to curate and organize and participate in a traveling exhibition that went to uh, schools of architecture in the US and Australia. It led to my first edited collection, uh, Feminist Practices, Interdisciplinary Approaches to Women in Architecture, which also then directly led through book talks to the co-founding of Architects, which is an equity organization for women in, based in New York City. And we create uh, programming and advocacy um, we, we help take action and create resources um, for all women identified individuals in the New York City region, as well as working with students across New York State. And one of our ongoing efforts that I wanna highlight is what we call WikiD, which is writing more women into Wikipedia. We realized 
uh, through an article that Desmond Stratocaucus had written that the representation of women on Wikipedia in the design and architecture area was woefully low. So we've been collaborating with groups in Melbourne and Berlin to write more women in, and we've received funding from the Wikimedia Foundation. So this will be ongoing until parity is reached. Another project I want to hi uh, quickly highlight is the Global Encyclopedia that Maya mentioned. This is an enormous project with expected publi publication date of 2023. This uh, will include over 1,100 entries of women across the globe. It's overseen by Karen and myself. We have 14 advisory board members, as well as 12 area editors. And then they've also created informal regional reference groups. So we are interested in putting forward a much more diverse and more radical idea of how architecture is practiced by women across the globe. So for example, we're, we're including far more underrecognized women practitioners, underrepresented communities who've had transformative effects at the local and national scales, those who uh, embark on research to expand the discipline of architecture, the educators and theorists who pioneer discussions of gender equity and minorities, as well as diversifying the discipline. And we really are striving to uncover the often invisible women working in government architecture and public works departments and historic preservation. So we're incredibly excited about the impact this will have both on curriculum, on libraries, and on the discipline more, more broadly. And the last area I want to quickly highlight is on diversifying the discipline. With uh, collaborators through architects, we have curated uh, the exhibition that's currently traveling, Now What? Advocacy, Activism, and Alliances in American Architecture Since 1968, which is, a, which is an interactive exhibition and online catalog with an eventual publication that tells the vibrant and largely unknown history of architects and designers whose vision of their profession aligned with and advanced the values of equality and social justice specifically those of the civil rights, feminist, and LGBTQ movements of the last half century. It opened in 2018 at Pratt in New York, in Brooklyn. Uh, a part of the exhibition, it's always around programming and bringing in uh, organizations and professors and students who are working and engaging in these areas. And we also ask that local, local information get written into the exhibition around our four categories of advocacy, representation, academy, and workplace. So this content literally gets added into each exhibition. We collect these at the end, and then we compile and create new panels that get included as the exhibition continues. We're excited that this exhibition will be at the Boston Society of Architects opening in March um, next year, assuming everything with COVID uh, remains uh, stable. So I just want to conclude by saying that all of these efforts I engage in seek to create more equitable spaces, be those the spaces of higher education, for whom and how architects design, and the types of research I focus upon, how we educate future generations of architects, where we make equity integral from the way we teach students to work and create balance in their lives, how students understand the role of the built environment that historically disenfranchised certain bodies, poor, black, brown, and immigrant, for example, and to ways design thinking can help us collaborate towards creating a different future is for me one of the most important contributions towards equity that I can be a part of. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lori, for that wonderful presentation. I would like to now invite all of our speakers to join me in the panel discussion portion of our event, uh, which will be followed by a Q&A with the audience. And as a reminder to our audience, if you haven't already, please type your questions in the Q&A comment box that's located just at the bottom of your Zoom window. So thank you again, Lori, Zara, Tarisha, and Lorene uh, for sharing your great insights so far on equitable public space design. There have been just so many thought provoking topics and common threads that have been covered uh, across your talks. 
um, we want to be mindful of the time. So we're just going to uh, just go over two questions in our panel discussion um, that are related to the uh, to the work of equitable public space design. And, and we hope that these will provide some useful takeaways for us all. And, and following that, again, we'll move into the Q&A with uh, our audience. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, in your experience, what are the challenges and barriers that architects and designers face in designing equitable public spaces. And um, I wonder if I can ask Zara to, to start us off. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many. I think it starts with control, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like I think the, the barriers to designing equitable public space, I think we're often, um, you know, pointing fingers at others and saying that, you know, there's, um, limited space and capacity and interest, but also I think, you know, and I think we were talking about this in our, um, in our pre-discussion, you know, as architects and designers and space makers, um, often I hear us say, well, who's not at the table, right? <laughs> like who's not at the table, but we're at the table. <laughs> and I think even if the institutions that we collaborate with or the clients that we work with are not open to increasing sort of the diversity and plurality of voices that get engaged in this work, I think uh, we have a responsibility to figure out how within our own practice and, and Lori said it so beautifully, how we work and interrogating how we set up our teams and how we set up sort of more um, space for people to succeed by working in ways that are more generous and more inclusive um, and not so toxic always, I think we can start to interrupt some of those systems. I think that's that's the first piece. The second piece is that we need to start debunking this myth around, well, to include community, to include a diverse set of voices, it takes more time. And I think, you know, and I can share the link in the chat right now. Well, maybe I can share it with you folks and you can circulate it when it's live. But there is a piece of work that I'm doing with the City of Toronto's planning department right now has to do with this exact question, which is, um, it takes too much time. We don't know how to do it. We don't have the skills to do it. We don't know who to talk to. And th the imperative for us and the challenge for us in designing equitable, equitable space is almost taking a harm reduction model, which is like, how do we do less harm to start with? So that can be small interventions and large interventions. That can be as small as co-developing um, engagement agendas or our plans for these workshops that all of us have talked about with folks that we're trying to engage, but it can be as sort of the most material expression, um, which can be really looking at our entire design process and sharing it with different stakeholders and different groups. That's like, you know, the most, um, you know, maybe the most desirable expression. And so I just think that, um, we need to debunk the, the myth that this, this work takes time. There are lots of ways to reduce harm in our process that don't take enough time, but they require us to interrogate how we show up and us and release control from being the dominant voice in the conversation. That's a really good point. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I wonder if I can ask Laureen um, to share. Mm -hmm. um, so, it was such a big part of our response in developing the think tanks. A barrier is that fear that, you know, we're the professionals at the table and we don't know how to respond. We don't know what to do. So let's not do anything or let's like just ask the accessibility specialist to do everything, <laughs> which really doesn't contribute to, you know, something, um, something really meaningful. So um, that, that sort of understanding, I think Zara, you talked about it a little bit around understanding our perspectives, where we're coming from, those gaps. You know, some of these, some of these things, you know, are fields and fields of research and precedence and long-standing knowledge base that, you know, we, you know, as practitioners in the field can't possibly uh, gain a comprehensive understanding within the month that we have to prepare. But recognizing that there is a series of, you know, maybe there are no immediate answers, but at least understanding the historical context or where some of these tensions are coming from and recognizing that some of the dialogue to date has really been around um, a certain perspective and focus. Um, so fear, I think, is a barrier and not knowing what to do with what we don't know and sort of just owning that and then 
understanding what you're going to do next with that fear. So 20 months ago, 18 months ago, I don't think I could have sat here and openly talked about not knowing about everything. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, what you do with that gap and, and how you address it is part, I think, of our responsibility as practitioners to evolve. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, Teresha, would you like to share as well? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Sarah and Lorraine um, spoke quite well on this, but I think just cost impact um, is often a uh, hesitancy with clients. They think it's going to cost more. So it's about educating them and showing them and explaining that it actually doesn't. And um, to what Sarah noted, um, it's also the schedule impact. Like, indeed, if you do... Um, impactful and authentic engagement throughout the course of the project. It's going to impact schedule. But again, um, communicating to your clients that um, this is an investment um, in shaping their community for the future. So it's something that, that they need to do and need to be accountable for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Lori. I guess I think about it a bit more, say, zoomed out and, and more about how do we demonstrate value and what does value mean? And how do we, as architects and people who are experts of the built environment, convey what that value means and its impact over, over the, say, the lifespan of the project? And how can we use that to create political buy-in for for the clients, for the communities that we're working with. So I think that the art and act of persuasion is quite critical. And I think if we're not both good communicators as well as being able to translate that into the value of the built environment, it, we're not gonna be successful in making these kinds of spaces happen. So I think clearly economics is a part of it, but I think it also has to be grounded in the social, cultural, community, city impact too, so that it people can register and it can resonate with them on both a personal individual le level, but also in a, in a much larger uh, positive impact of the city. Mm -hmm. So scalar. So Vora, can I hot pursuit that really quick? Yeah, for sure. And this, uh, this conversation is completely in your answer so far, totally lead into our next question as well. So uh, go ahead, Zara, and then I'll pose the next question to you all. I just, I want to re reorient the conversation on engagement, um, you know, to our audience around, mm -hmm. this is not the right thing to do. This is actually a, a, a strategic imperative for architects and developers to be thinking about because this kind of inclusive engagement that we talk about de-risks projects and actually makes sure that they serve needs when they're built the first time and not create more mistrust of government development institutions and architects longer term. And so while it is, you know, sometimes I find that when we talk about inclusive design, it's, it's, it's just about like the good people doing the right thing. And this is actually like so important as core to our strategy around how we build city, build cities is that it's actually, and Lori, what Lori said sort of sparked my thinking, which is it's an economic imperative. We can't afford to make the same mistakes we've made over the last few generations. And we need to get it, get closer to getting it right the first time we, we build things. And so, um, you know, it's about, it's, it's also about de-risking the work that we do uh, mm -hmm. longer term. Yeah, completely. I, and, and our next question, which is really a follow-up of exactly what you're starting to talk about um, is, you know, what are the challenges or, well, we, we've discussed the challenges and barriers, but I think this, and you've all started to kind of share some of the strategies, but I wonder if you could share more of what you have found to be effective strategies for encouraging clients and stakeholders and policymakers, right, to buy in uh, and prioritize equitable uh, design in projects. And you've each uh, started to already talk about this, but I wonder if you could add more. Um, I can start that. I think um, what we try to do, because sometimes you can tell them all you want, all you want and all you know, and they still won't listen. So one of our strategies is to take them on tours and show them what works and, and what doesn't work and um, hold, hold um, even ourselves accountable for our own designs. So making sure those processes work. So it's not, it's a, you know, it's about engagement. It's about engaging the spaces after and, and speaking to the people who are using the spaces much, much like 
not just a couple hours after, but years and years after to make sure that that the space is indeed um, successful or not successful and why is it? So, um, for example, at MJMA, we um, are working with a firm called Disability Solution, I'm working with a fellow named Matt Shaw, um, where he, we, the group of us go to different uh, sites, uh, sorry, designed different, uh, different years um, with a long stretch of, of 30 years of um, buildings um, and just looking at them together with the lens of, of um, two athletes that have both sight and hearing impairments, just as one example of doing that. And just looking not only, um, so looking above and beyond code and um, what the intent of the building was and what the actual impact is um, and how we collaborate um, to audit our strengths and weaknesses, not only about the design of the space, but also thinking about the programming and how we can um, enhance that in the future. And, and then I guess the idea is just to continue to find those kind of mismatches in design and make these experiences hopefully better for the next time around. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Teresha. Would anyone else like to jump in? Hi, Sephora. So, okay. You know, it's it's an interesting question, and um, I think we're in a little bit of a unique position because because we're a consultant uh, focusing on a specific task. We're very lucky to have clients and partners um, who are coming to the table who are already engaged and interested. Um, so it's a you know, I feel sort of sheepish here now saying like, what do we do to be effective and encouraging? But we're already finding that we're at the, we're at the point of the conversation where it's already on the table. And so the next thing we need to build on is how do we find strategies that A, are, um, you know, can be considered early on so that those space implications, typically it's around space, you know, are, are, are thought about upfront, but also, you know, what are those what we like to think about low hanging fruit elements that we can easily implement that still have those same impact around, um, uh, you know, cr creating, I mean, in specific accessibility, creating accessible spaces without necessarily being more costly. So, you know, being there early always helps, but we've been lucky to have great partnerships. <laughs> so um, it's a, it's a, yeah. I'll stop talking. <laughs> That's good to hear as well. It's good to hear of the examples where, yeah, clients that are already engaged and interested in taking these steps. Um, Zara and Lori, do you have anything to add before we, on this question? And we have a number of questions coming in from the audience. So I'm going to move on to that afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, Lorraine just like really um, articulated it beautifully, which is here we are, right? Here mm -hmm. We are. And this is sort of, you know, um, my reflection in thinking about coming to this talk, which was, um, this is not no longer, this is no longer kids table conversation. This is adults table conversation, equity, fairness, and justice, where it used to be, you know, for the like more socially minded practitioners. And now the imperative is for all of us to be more socially minded. Um, mm -hmm. And that being said, I think, you know, there is, we still want to like study our way out of this. So now that people are galvanized, they're like looking at contextual like research, you know, there's a lot of desk research happening. And I think Tarisha's point around these more immersive experiences that are not meant to be this sort of like observation of our of lived experiences other than our own, but more to say, when you have these immersive experiences, when you are on site, when you are, you know, I'm working on a, a development in Northwest Toronto that's 420 acres, and our invitation to the developers is take the bus there next time you go. It's in Northwest Toronto, which was hardest hit by COVID, highest population of, uh, highest density of, of um, Black communities in Toronto, just like layer in all of this sort of um, levels of barriers, and they're compacted, they're, they're sort of they intersect in Northwest Toronto. And part of it is not to say, and part of it is to get them on the bus and say, ride the bus, see what the experience is like and acknowledge the limits of your knowledge, <laughs> right? It's not to, not to say like, oh, I've had that experience, but really to say, this is the boundary of my lived experience and I can feel it. I can mm -hmm. see it. You know, we were on a walk in Regent Park. I'm working on the development there, the final two phases there. We're on a walking tour 
and you know folks have different mobility issues on our on our uh, tour and you know can't go down the sidewalk and join the rest of us right and and so it's like you feel it because you feel it you don't you know study it so I would say that's to what Trisha pointed out is so important and then just to quickly um just touch on what Jennifer put in the uh, in the chat, I think is really ties into this really nicely, which has been, I think we're, we're getting to the end of the consultation engagement era where we think that that is a material and germane way to engage and get sort of um, get people in, a con in conditions of safety to speak their truth. And so things like what I was talking about, I've done tons of distance uh, ethnography over WhatsApp about built environment projects um, over, over the last number of years phone lines where people actually have a phone number they can call and be like, this, my neighborhood's weird. <laughs> yeah. And so just trying to think about different ways uh, of letting people speak in sort of in the moments where things feel um, present with them is, mm. is super important and they're easier than we think. The only thing I'd wanna add, and I wanna take this into the space that the Academy is to introduce students to these issues in the studio and in their courses so that once they graduate, the expectation is they would go into practices where this is already happening. So it's not that they get introduced to it at when, once they're in the profession, but they're, and they do, the students are coming to college with the expectation of engagement and issues of equity, issues of anti-racism, decolonizing. So this is, they are really invested. There's been a clear shift in students' consciousness and what they're interested in their politics. So I think that the academy is critical in preparing students and to push the discipline even harder once they, for, for what they expect when they, when they graduate. So I think we have a role to play as well in transforming and hopefully changing the expectations of what does a practice look like and the kinds of practices that they'll seek out. So I think it comes from both sides too, which I find super exciting and, and it shouldn't be so, you know, we do certain kinds of projects in the university that have no real bearing or understanding, which leads to one of the questions about how can architectural education change? We absolutely have to change in order to be more reflective and responsive to our, to our populations and the needs of our population. So I, I think it's, it's also in, in the, our responsibility as educators is very critically a part of this too. Thank you, Laurie. Yes, and I'm going to uh, uh, just go into the Q&A session with that. Um, so there was a question uh, from Cassie here. Um, and the question is, does architecture education need to change to make architects less afraid of giving up power and inviting more voices to the design table? Uh, so thanks, Laurie. Uh, I don't know if you want to continue to add to that, uh, what you've already started. In lieu of time, I, that, I'm good. <laughs> Uh, Zara, Laureen, or, or Tricia, would you like to? Do you have a? Would you like to also comment on this question? If not, we might move to another. Uh, the next question from the audience. Um, oh, I will. Oh, no, go ahead, Zara. Yeah. yeah. Wanted to wait and see if anyone else did. Just really quickly, this is about also um, managing expectations. I think and um, not make like I think right now there's a crash and burn into reality from like these, this, the academy, which is like, is turning into a much more generative space to, and lateral space to talk about these. And the profession is still saying that's a nice to have and not a have to have. And so <laughs> mm -hmm. I will say that I am, you know, very nervous and I've met many dozens and dozens and dozens now of these students who are saying, um, you know, it, it really is a crash landing uh, out of school. And so I think even just as a culture within our uh, professional practices, starting to not make these special conversations, but embed these, you know, and, and like mm -hmm. talk about our identities at the start of projects. I think that starts to be the things within our realm of control that we can do to start changing the cultures within the organizations, even if not all of our projects are, you know, all the expressions uh, that we wanna see of, of equity that we wanna see. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Laureen, Tricia, would you like to add anything to this? Okay, um, 
And this leads, I, I'd like to, the next question I wanted to bring up and this leads to kind of Zara, what you started to talk about at the end of your answer, there's uh, a question from Betsy Williamson. Have you found meaningful uptake of your advocacy by changing minds on design projects? And I'm curious too, of if each of you might have um, a story to share <laughs> um, of a project where you really sense the, the impact um, of your work and focus on this, on this type of, um, uh, you know, approach, inclusive approach to design projects and how that impacted others that you're working with. Laureen, would you like to uh, start us off on that? When I'm thinking about meaningful uptake, um, it, it's kind of an interesting position because when we're having discussions about what we can and can't do, it's often faced with, well, we can't do that. You're like, okay, well, we can't do that. So now you're hearing me <laughs> and you're, you're, you're understanding we've presented analysis, you know, we've done all our desk research, are, we've shared it, we've you know, honed in on the lived experience. And someone is now saying, we can't do this. We can't do this, we can't do this. But I'm seeing that as, okay, you're hearing, and there's a little bit of a, a pause there in time where it almost becomes in a lot of organizations an in, in, uh, inter-organization discussion. You know, what are we willing to commit to? What do we have to do? How are we gonna deal, typically it's building. So what are we gonna do in our existing stock? And what are we gonna do in the new stock sort of becomes the discussion. But, um, you know, I, I've learned to hear, we can't do this as, okay, you're hearing. So that's a good start as opposed to blank stare. <laughs> blank stare, don't know what to do with what you've just said. So I, I almost like to hear the, um, the no and um, sort of push that, uh, that ongoing conversation afterwards. I mean, I can just share a, 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 recent, um, a recent development on a project where we were developing a program and we wanted to introduce a universal washroom um, in a public, um, public lobby space. Um, and the clients were hesitant, um, but it was about uh, listening to that hesitancy and listening to what they're saying, um, because some points were, uh, you know, some, it, it's worth listening to and seeing how you can actually accommodate those um, hesitancies. So in this case, uh, there was um, uh, older elderly women were uh, maybe thinking they might be afraid if they were to engage in a, in a universal washroom space or dads with their daughters maybe felt awkward about and listening to what their issues are, which um, gave us an idea about, well, how do we promote choice of different types of stalls that have sinks or don't have sinks or gives you the opportunity to use the um, universal sink or not use it. Or, and also the um, door orientation and proximity to the public lobby space. How deep can you, or do, do you engage um, to, to be in those types of spaces? And so um, by doing that, we were able to successfully add um, that program uh, to, to our project and, um, and in, in a successful way. Thanks, Tricia. Uh, Lori or Zara, would you like to? Add anything to this? Uh, I would just say, I think I think about the, I'm very invested in bringing architecture out into um, areas where they don't really understand our value or what we do. So, and most of this for me is more research oriented, but also I have done pro bono projects, um, a local women's shelter, for example, where they just wanted to make spaces more efficient, but then you know, to talking about well, the quality of spaces matter. It matters to the women who are who are in residence there for the time that they have, and why those qualities matter, and how it can improve just their daily existence. So, really trying to educate those who don't fully understand the the value of the built environment and how it can improve people's daily lives. Um, I think is really important. And so at least through my advocacy and, and trying to raise that awareness, people are sometimes really surprised that architecture could or should be used and engaged in areas that they just don't think it, it would be. Or like even when I went to do interviews across the country with um, abortion providers, none of them had worked with an architect. 
None of them thought they could afford an architect or why they would need an architect, but they all understood the value of the experience of those spaces for their patients. So it's how do we translate our expertise into a language that they that people can understand because on some level they do understand it but they don't equate it necessarily with what we do or with architecture so i'm really invested in how we bring our expertise into those arenas where we are just not present and and or people think they can't afford our our uh, our expertise Lori, I feel like you're gonna, and Maya, you're gonna appreciate in particular being close to the academy in the academy, what I'm gonna say, but show your process, <laughs> right? Like, I think that's our, always been our perennial issue. And now part of showing our process is showing that we have a nuanced point of view on the people we're trying to serve. Um, that's something that we're, uh, I think there's, there's a real inherent fear of people in some of these institutions that we work with, there's a fear of talking to people, there's a fear of what they might say. And so I think as part of showing our process and articulating our value, it's really saying part of our value is taking, taking those needs and having real human conversations with people and collectively expressing them in design um, is, is our process, is our value. And then just the other piece is uptake. I think we need to just re also uh, open the aperture on what uptake of our advocacy actually means. And I think our advocacy, while it should end up in design outcomes, it should also end up in deeper civic literacy. Like, you know, we need deeper civic literacy through the process. A lot of my work is about hiring local folks, creating employment opportunities, career pathways towards intergenerational intergener wealth, intergenerational wealth creation through these projects. So it's not just we're engaging people and we're you know, having good conversations, but we're going a step further, which is how do we create employment opportunities and career pathways to, to have these folks as long-term collaborators, not just one-time collaborators on projects. Um, and yeah, I think I, I think I would just say that we need to think about process and outcome as we advocate um, and work with folks who are typically underrepresented in built environment, in the development of our built environment. We just need to keep those two pieces in mind when we advocate. And I'm finding that these days, the uptake is very high on the process piece, which is like, how do we actually bring people into um, employment opportunities and, and you know, the way that we're doing things uh, versus just have their voices better represented in the outcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I'm uh, mindful of the time and uh, we're, we're at 12 o'clock right now. So uh, our time is up for the Q&A, uh, but I would like to invite our speakers. There are some other questions. Um, feel free if you have a moment to uh, type an answer back uh, on those. Um, and I'd like to just thank you all uh, for, for everything that you've shared with us. I'm very grateful uh, to have had the opportunity to learn from all of you today. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand it off to Maya uh, to close off the event. Yes, thanks again to our speakers, uh, Laureen Cazier, Lori Brown, Teresha Dolanik, and Zara Ibrahim for joining us today and sharing their experiences, expertise, and perspectives on designing equitable public spaces. Uh, thank you as well to our audience members today for joining us on a Saturday morning and participating in this very important discussion. Uh, please note that you may sign up for our mailing list on the BEAT website to receive notifications for more upcoming virtual events. And you can also follow BEAT on Instagram, Facebook, um, and Twitter to stay up to date. Lastly, a special thank you to our 2021 sponsors for making this event possible. We just celebrated our sixth birthday this past fall, and we're incredibly grateful for the continued support from the architecture and design community. So again, thank you all, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend.